Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to be back. Hope everybody had a blessed Feast of Tabernacles. We had a restful Feast of Tabernacles. Not a whole lot to do where we went, but uh, it was lovely. We came back feeling very refreshed. So hopefully you had a peaceful, blessed Feast of Tabernacles and are rejuvenated for the six-month wait for the spring holy days to begin. But they'll be here before we know it, just like the feast is over already. It seems like we were just really looking forward to the Feast of Tabernacles this year, and now, now it's over and we're looking forward to the spring holy days. So as I mentioned, I feel like I came back from the feast this year just really rejuvenated, very peaceful. Maybe it was because we didn't run 17 hours a day or something like that, like sometimes we're guilty of doing. Um, but I came back and I just felt at peace and not really worried about anything. You know, the feast is always wonderful, but sometimes getting back into the swing of things, getting back to work, um, you know, getting back into the normal daily routines isn't nearly as joyful as the Feast of Tabernacles, right? And uh, sometimes, sometimes we might actually have some, some little thing to worry about, you know. Nothing to worry about at all at the Feast of Tabernacles, but maybe when we get back into the swing of things, maybe there's a little bit of something to worry about. So how about you? Are you refreshed and rejuvenated this year after the Feast of Tabernacles? Or is there something that's worrying you? Something that's uh, on your mind? Some, maybe it's a job issue or maybe a family issue or some sort of health problems. You know, we, we, all, we all don't have to look very far at all to be concerned about health issues these days. But, um, but we're told in the Bible, lots and lots of places, that we are not to be worriers. We're not to be anxious, unusually anxious. We're just not called to that kind of life, a life of worry and unusual concern. Because after all, um, we know what the end of the story is and we win. So the point, the, the title today is, begin with the end in mind, a strategy for worry. Begin with the end in mind, a strategy for worry. I know for a fact, I hear it all the time, um, that we do have, a, we do have a, a battle, a constant battle with worrying. I hear it on talk radio. People are worried about the Titans. Well, how are they going to do against the Jets? You know, the Jets are 0-3, but we're real worried. Well, what, what needs, who, who really needs to worry is the Jets facing Derrick Henry. They're the ones who need to worry. Any football fans in the audience? Okay, I'm going to be talking a little bit about football today. But um. I got, I got this begin with the end in mind from Stephen Covey. He has this book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And the second habit is begin with the end in mind. The first is be proactive. The third is put first things first. The fourth, think win-win, which is one I like to dwell on. Um, fifth is seek first to understand, then to be understood. Six is synergize. And habit seven is sharpen the saw, almost like stay educated. But this second one, begin with the end in mind, is what I really want to focus in on today. Imagine the book of Job, one of my favorite books, Job. Um, imagine if, if Job could have seen the end of what, what was happening to him at the beginning of the book of Job. I'm going to go to James 5.11 to start off with, and I'm going to read a little bit in Job. But imagine if Job could have seen what the end was when he was going through his trial. James 5.11 says, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Job 42, beginning in verse 10, Job 42, 10 through 16 talks about, kind of summarizes this story. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then all his brothers, all his sisters, and all those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house. And they consoled him and confronted him, uh, comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. 
Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep. I think he started off with 7,000 sheep, right? 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemima, the sec name of the second Kezia, and the name of the third Karen Hepuk. I haven't done my homework on this. I don't know how to pronounce those exactly, so bear with me. Um, verse 15, in all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And here, listen to this, verse 16, after this, after all the trial, after all the extra blessing after the trial, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So just, isn't it great that that's who we get to serve? That's God, that's how he, that's how he blesses. He knows the end and the plans he has for us to bless us and not hurt us, not see us hurt. So I'm gonna read several verses passages today, and all of this is to encourage us when worry crops up to begin with the end in mind and know that at the end of the day, we win. And these are encouraging verses. Jeremiah 29, 11 is my wife's favorite verse. Jeremiah 29, 11 in the New King James Version says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Yet, we're not perfect yet, so we still have a tendency to worry from time to time, maybe a lot. So I've been pretty much an open book um, during my speaking times and talked about my troubles, my trials and tribulations, uh, whether it's a job challenge, you know, I've had, I had somebody say, well, uh, you're not going to get to go to the Feast of Tabernacles th this year because it's the budget season. And I said, oh, you just don't get it. You just don't understand. I'll have the budget all done well before the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, but yes, I will be going to the Feast of Tabernacles and I haven't missed one yet. And that job just went away. It went away. It was a good job, but it went away. And guess what? There was another one. There was another really good one right after that. But we do have, we all can, we will, we can all manufacture reasons to worry and be unusually concerned. So before we go to the end of the story, I want to read Psalms 119, 159 to 165. Again, these are encouragement verses to not worry about issues and problems in our lives that crop up. Psalm 119, 159 to 165. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure I hate and abhor lying, but I love your law. Seven times a day, here's a strategy for confronting worry. Seven times a day, I praise you. That is something we could write up on a list and put it on our mirror. Seven times a day, I take time out to praise. Because of your righteous judgments, great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. So what is there to worry about? Just reading that minimizes turmoil. Going to the beach helps me to uh, regain, regain some perspective about just how big God is and how minusculely nothing I am. Who can, who can sit on the beach, watch the waves, hear the waves clap? And oh, if it's an extra blessing if you just so happen to have a nice thunderstorm rolling through. Isn't that wonderful? Um, at the beach, that, that's, I don't worry when I'm at the beach. You know, God, God's huge and I'm nothing. And he's there, he's got my back. 
like to go to Deuteronomy 30 next. Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 through 20. Another very encouraging, encouraging passage. It says, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments that what? That you may live and multiply. And so in the Mike Fushi version of this, I put a, I put a little uh, parentheses there. Don't worry. No, live and multiply. Don't worry, just live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land in which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away, in the Mike Fushi version says, and you start to worry, back to the real text here, turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. And the Mike Fushi version here says, and be worried to death. Be worried to death. You shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Lots and lots of good key words in that passage pertaining, I mean, pointing to a life filled with joy and abundance, not worry and lack, like life, good, love, walk in his ways, live, multiply, love the Lord your God, blessing, cling to him, and length of days. Romans 5, the next passage. Romans 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory, glory in tribulations. Isn't that interesting? We can glory in tribulations. Instead of worrying about tribulations, we can glory in them. We can smile at them. Almost laugh at tribulation when it comes around. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which was given to us. So before we go, before we go to the end of the story, actually reaching a conclusion, so Dave, Dave, Dave would probably have an hour and a half to speak today because this is going to be somewhat short. I know we have some Titans fans in here. I've been a crazy, um, time-wasting <laughs> Titans fans ever since they came to here in 1997. Um, the struggle is real, isn't it? You know, we, we've had lots and lots of years of, of, uh, of uh, frustrating games from time to time. We've had really good games, fun games, winning games, but we've also had some frustrating games. There have been so many games when we were down in the fourth quarter by somewhere between one point and 15 points, maybe four or five minutes left to go in the game, and down 15 points with four, four or five minutes to go. Like a game recently that, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, we played the Seahawks and we were down 15 points. And you know, you can't, you can't start off, you can't start off a season losing games. At least I don't, I don't like my team to start off the season losing games. But it sure did look like they were off to a really bad start this year. But for some reason, for some reason or another, I had a pretty good feeling about that game. Late in the fourth quarter, I just had a funny feeling they were gonna find a way to win. And they did. But, um, but before that, you know, I, I saw my Titans getting whipped all up and down the field. And I was frustrated and a little bit upset, a little bit, a little bit worrying about, about them possibly losing a game. 
But then a peace came over me, and I thought, they're going to win this game. I don't know how, but they're going to win it. And that's exactly what they did. So imagine the feelings you have during a football game when your team's losing and how gross it's going to feel for a few days after that, knowing that your Titans lost the game. Well, um, you can also wait a few days. This year, up in Cincinnati, there was no way to watch the game. So I had to actually listen to it on, on the Nashville radio station over the internet and just envision what it all looked like. But sometimes uh, they'll do a replay later on in the week so you can watch the whole game in about an hour. And you know when they win, you watch that and you just wanna you know, see the nuances, watch the game again, enjoy the game. But when you know the end, when you know the end is a win, it's amazing how different you feel all during the game. There's no worry, there's no concern, because you know the end. But I still like to watch, watch those, uh, those replays. So remember um, Stephen Covey's second habit, begin with the end in mind. Revelation 22 is the end, and this is how I'm going to conclude today. Revelation 22, beginning in verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, a new crop every single month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Imagine the healing of the nations. You know, are we, are we worried about the Middle East? You know, the big blow up that, we're, that we know is gonna happen at some point? China and the effect that China has on our economy? The West Bank eruptions? I mean, Israel has missiles and bombs being poured on them all the time. Are we worried about that? <clears throat> well, here's where these nations will finally, finally be healed in Revelation 22. <clears throat> and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. That's where we're headed. His servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There will be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That's the end. <laughs> That's the end. What in the world is there during this temporary, physical, nothing life uh, that we should worry about when we know that that's where we're headed? That's the end. <clears throat> then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. How would you like to hear some faithful, true words on TV or the radio these days? Not propaganda or half-truths, but faithful and true words. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. In the end, that's not going to be a part of the kingdom. <clears throat> I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. 
I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Knowing the end, are you worried about anything in this short, limited life? God says, give all of our cares to him. He says, be anxious for nothing. Instead, pray about everything. God promises if we do that, he will send peace that surpasses all understanding. So to borrow the words out of the famous philosopher from the 80s who used to write some rock and roll songs, don't worry, be happy, and begin with the end in mind.